thank you so much for being here. We're absolutely delighted to welcome all of you, and especially to welcome Teresa Carl Sanders here to the store. Um, she, as you know, is the author of Apple in the Kitchen and the creator of the blog of the same name. Um, she um, created these wonderful recipes that you got to try tonight, all based on, um, both of them based on Voyager, upcoming season three of the show. So it's a show for you. Uh, Teresa is going to say a few things about the book. She's going to answer a few questions. Um, and she is, of course, going to sign copies of your book. Um, we do still have some. If you um, still want to purchase the book from us, we have just a couple of the postcards left. And it is a recipe card that's signed by Teresa and by Diana. So if you, um, if you um, purchase the book from us, you can sign copies of this. And then when um, Teresa is done speaking, we will also wrap up. There you go. Exactly. Exhibit A. <laughs> And so um, when Teresa's done speaking, we will also raffle the apron and um, recipe card and salt. And a little bit of salt. Yeah, it's just going to let her get the pack. It's not a lot, but it's just a Yeah, yeah. So we'll raffle that at the end of the talk as well. So please join me in welcoming Teresa Carl. Thank you for having me, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I don't know if everybody's had a chance to come up and try a dish or two yet, but I'll just quickly tell you what they are. This one is almond squirts, and it's a really delicious cookie with a really unfortunate name. <laughs> um, it's got a little, they're almond meringues, they're gluten-free, so if you're not doing gluten, that's probably a good selection, and it's almost right out of an 18th century cookbook. Um, Diana gets a lot of her, she has two or three original 18th century cookbooks on her bookshelves, if you've ever seen pictures of her bookshelves, and she combs through there looking for inspiration for food in the books, and almond squirts are from one of those books that she has on her shelf. And then we have um, Mr. Willoughby's Coral Knob, which is pimento cheese, and Mr. Willoughby's Coral Knob, for just as a reminder, was that little um, thing he had on his Mandarin cap, and he lost it when he fled China, but Jamie restored it to him. So that's pimento cheese. It's a southern dish. Um, it was actually created at the turn of the century in New York when they created cream cheese for the first time. They made pimento cheese, but it sort of dropped out of favor in the north after World War II, and it's now considered mostly a southern thing. So you're welcome to help yourself to that as we go along. Um, I thought I'd just start with how my Outlander story started, because we've all got an Outlander story, I think. I think that's why we all gather together, so we can tell each other our Outlander stories without people looking at us like we're crazy. Um, I, mine began in 2001, and I worked at FedEx in Vancouver, and I was a pretty unhappy person. I'm not what, smiling like I am today. Um, it was a good job. It paid really well. I had a, an employee group of about 45 people. Um, but it just wasn't me, and I found myself, I was basically a psychiatrist all day, and I would sit in my office, and my employees would come through, and we'd talk about how unhappy we are. Um, and one day, we had a very unhappy customer who didn't like my answer when he told me he had to have a package in Japan the next day, and when I told him it was all ready the next day in Japan, and the de his deadline had already passed, he, there was, it actually got really quite heated. Um, I, I, I remember talking about Superman flying backwards rings around the earth in order to get his package to Japan on time. Anyway, it didn't end well, and it ended in a shower of waybills when he just had a total tantrum, and he just went, ah! and he threw them all up in the air and made a mess in the front lobby, and we called the police, and they came and escorted him out, and then I went for a really long walk. A really, really, really long walk. And I ended up at the top of Burrard Street Bridge, which is a really iconic bridge in Vancouver, <coughs> Same scenery as Seattle, right? Mountains, si sky, sea. And before I really even knew what I was doing, I had reached into my back pocket and dropped my cell phone off the bridge. Um, because I was done. I was really, really done. And my husband had been begging me to quit that job for months, and I finally did. The only <coughs> thing I forgot was to call my boss before I threw the phone off the bridge. <laughs> so I walked back to the office, and gave him two weeks' notice. And the very first day, dog-free day I had, I wandered into a bookstore. And I, for the first time in years, my mom read to me in the cradle, and I'd always been a reader. But one of the things I lost in that job, that career path, 
was um, my connection to reading. And I found, as I was wandering the shelves that day, a black and, and red book with a big gold clock on the cover. And I turned it around and I thought, wow, time travel, Highlanders, sounds great. Like, that's exactly what I need. I just needed an escape. And many of us talk about an escape or using Outlander to get through a period of grief or transition, and that's exactly what I did. I read those books solidly until the very end of The Fiery Cross, which was the last book at the time. And then I went back to Outlander and I started them all over again. <laughs> and uh, it's a familiar story. And, um, and, and, then, and then we decided we didn't want to live in Vancouver anymore. And part of the reason was because I quit my job and we couldn't afford to live in Vancouver anymore. Um, but we moved to a small island called Pender, which we've lived on now for 13 years. And it's a really quiet place, about 2,200 people. Um, and we didn't have a plan, and we struggled for a few years. And then my dad died. And he died rather suddenly. And um, I decided, I figured out that we were all mortal and that I better do get something done. So I ended up on a silent retreat in Maine. My husband's very tolerant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> And he's always pushing me out the door to do whatever crazy thing I come up with. So I went to a silent retreat in the state of Maine, um, where no eye contact and no talking for a week. And it's amazing what happens when you can't talk to someone or even communicate with your eyes. And it, basically what came up was that I love to read. We already knew that. Um, but that I love to cook, and I should have been a chef from the very beginning. In fact, I filled out a, a cooking school application right out of high school. Um, it just, things came up and I went traveling and I never went back to it. But I decided on that silent retreat that that's what I needed to do, so I went back to Vancouver and told my husband that in three weeks I was moving back to Vancouver with my mother for six months and going to cooking school. And he agreed. He's a very tolerant guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, was one, there was one chair left when I signed up for that particular course. Um, and I was one of three women in a class of mostly 19 and 20 year old boys. They were boys, they weren't men. <laughs> <laughs> They're men now, I still have t keep in touch with some of them. Um, that was in 2008. And then one day in 2010, after I'd worked on Pender for a couple years in restaurants, but you know there's a reason 38 year olds women don't go back to cooking school because they don't want to be cooks in hot kitchens on small islands where you're never going to make a lot of money. Um, I just realized all of a sudden that I had spent a lot of money on cooking school and really only made 12 bucks an hour as a cook. Anyway. So I was walking in the woods with my dog, which I do every day, and pigeon rolls with truffles came up into my head one day. They just popped into my head on this walk. And uh, so by the time I'd gotten home, I had a recipe for pigeon rolls with truffles in my head, and I had a five-question interview and an email for Diana that I sent off to her Canadian publicist that afternoon. Diana answered the very next day with a very resounding, enthusiastic, yes, what a great idea. It's kind of weird, but let's give it a try. <laughs> so we did Pigeon Rolls with Truffles, and Diana shared that across her Twitter dome and her Facebook, and it was really popular. So a couple of months later, I, we'd, uh, we'd just been to Scotland, and I tried varieties up and down Scotland trying to find the perfect variety, and I didn't find one that was even almost edible. But anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> and um, so I emailed her when we got home from Scotland, and I said, let's, I'd really like to try Brianna's varieties. And she said, great, let's do it. OK, cool. <laughs> so then I started asking her about a cookbook. But that was before the TV show had been announced, and it was um, they were fearful that there's lots, millions of fans for Outlander, but not necessarily enough to buy a cookbook because not all, but not every fan is going to buy a cookbook. And Diane has only ever had bestsellers, and her handlers were concerned that maybe it would be such a big success. So we waited, and then all of a sudden in 2013, they announced the TV series. And I always say, when you're following a dream, like this has been a big dream of mine for about five years that, um, I, that I followed, and you need to work really hard, you need to have great spousal support or partner support, <laughs> Um, but you also have to have a piece of luck. And my piece of luck was stars announcing that television series because quite soon after, um, we, did the, we did the first season and stars asked me to do a featured recipe with each, with each show, so we did that. And when stars share something, even crazier things happen than when Diana shares something. So, um, my Facebook page 
grew up to, I think I'm up at 46,000 now. And, uh, and that's when we got a call about a book. So the book, I signed the deal in May of 2015. May of 2014. They're all molding into one. No, 2015. 2015. And, uh, and I had the book finished in November. So that's six months. There's 50 recipes from the blog, um, some of the more popular ones from the blog, and then there's 50 brand new recipes inside that have never been on the blog, and they were created solely for the cookbook. Um, oh, I think that's, that's about it. I'm just thrilled with, thank you all for coming, I'm thrilled with the support that the book has gotten in its first six weeks. It's selling really well. Um, it was number 20 on the Nielsen Book Scan for Dawn Fiction Books a couple of weeks ago. And it's been on BuzzFeed, which always helps. I'm not really, I'm a little old for BuzzFeed, but. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I saw millions and millions of clicks, I wasn't that old. Um, and, uh, and it's apparently coming out, it's going to be featured in People Magazine in September. Ooh, wow. So they're wow. in the wow. issue. Wow. Yeah, wow. Wow. great. And, um, and, for, and for hanging in on the blog for so many years, it's been a really fun journey, and I hope it continues. I'm just starting to plan a, a tour down to California. So hopefully that will happen. We'll have three or four stops down there. Anybody have some entertainment weekly? Oh, and entertainment weekly, yeah. It's in the big spread of, there's about six um, show cookbooks in there, including Game of Thrones, Baking Bad, which is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. 
country and where we are now. When I thought of turtle soup, it's definitely been one of the more requested uh, recipes I've had in this journey because it ends in an amorous situation and we all <laughs> like that situation. Um, but I knew that I wasn't going to buy turtle and I knew that most people weren't going to buy turtle. So then I thought to myself, you know, night in bed, I was like, oh, well, Alice in Wonderland has mock, a mock turtle. And the Victorians actually had mock turtle soup that they made. Um, but it had sheep's heads and pig's trotters and all sorts of even crazier things in it. No, oh, that's not going to work. So one, one day I bought a couple of pounds of oxtail, which makes a really beefy meat. Um, and I tried that. And, I, and you know, you want to kind of try and get some sea, uh, the taste of the sea in with that turtle soup. And I tried a couple of things. I tried scallops. That was a really bad idea. That was just terrible. Um, but one, but when I was just when I was running out of home, I looked at my, up on my pantry shelf, and there was a bottle of fish sauce there. Those are almond foe. squirts. They're cookies. So what I made was 18th century turtle foe, but I made it with oxtail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I threw, and then I researched New Orleans has a turtle soup and Philadelphia has a turtle soup from about the 18th century. And so I researched those and I kind of combined them and threw that in there to make it complete and a full bottle of sherry. The text says, <laughs> a, the text says a full bottle of sherry and I like to stick with the text. <laughs> Be authentic. You, exactly. Authenticity is everything. That's right. It's everything. But then you know you come up and uh, and there's a lot of 21st century um, recipes in there because it's the 21st century and although some people think they want to live in the 18th century and cook that way, if they've ever cooked over a hearth after about an hour, they're done with it. Like done. Yeah. Um, and the taste is a particularly good. Um, always. Sometimes it can be very good, like the papalichi soup, but most of the time. It's either too heavily spiced, or it's not, or it's not got enough familiar ingredients in it. We, we like to have familiar things when we're putting things in our mouth, and we've changed the way we eat radically even since the 70s. So there has to be some um, some adaptions along the way in order to make it a usable cookbook, which is what I really wanted out of this. I want people to use it, and I would love it to have three stains on pages and. Um, and, and use it rather than have it be a piece of merchandise that sits in your living room along with all your other sign outlets. <laughs> <laughs> so send pictures of grease flowers. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Flatter <laughs> <Flatter> <laughs> Finally, the flowers. <laughs> Just curious with um, so many great recipes in the cookbook, how did you decide which one would make the cover? Is that one of your favorite ones? Or? I actually had nothing to do with that cover. I'm really lucky. So an author rarely has anything to do with the cover, any power, any influence, anything. Um, this picture is taken by Rebecca Wellman, who's the photographer that we used, and she lives in Victoria. So all the big, beautiful photographs that you see in here are Rebecca's. Mine are the smaller ones that are more instructional in nature. <laughs> um, and they're not quite as beautiful. Um, now, Rebecca, um, they had an idea, Random House had an idea for a cover, and it, Rebecca and I, it scared Rebecca and I, so she actually went to a theater company and got, borrowed an 18th century dress, not this one, this is not 18th century dress, um, and did a mock-up, and they loved it, thank goodness, because the other idea wasn't, it was a, it was a big medieval looking feast with a, with a stag's head on the table. It was very male and very Game of Thrones-ish. Like if it was a Game of Thrones book, it would have been perfect. Um, so we picked the tarts because they're the most colorful, but really Rebecca's, most of the artistry and all of the design and everything you see on that is what Rebecca came up with at the time. The dress is the only change because 18th century dresses are more full, and the volume is such that we couldn't get a sharp photo of the tarts. So this is actually more like a Jane Austen. Yeah, over here. Yes, ma'am. I was interested a little bit in your, your process of actually like having people sample it. What What do you do? Do you have like three good friends that say, "Okay, taste this. And tell me your honest opinion." The first, how do you? The first victim is always my husband. <laughs> Good guy. <laughs> he's a really great guy. He's a, um, he's a good dishwasher too. Um, he was 
a he was a founding member of the Tolkien Society. Sorry, he was a founding member of the Tolkien Society in London when he was eight years old. Oh. <laughs> He's fifty three now, but he can tell you stories of being escorted through the tube in London by Gandalf, an older man in the seventies wearing a full Gandalf hat, cloak, and everything. And, and Howard's mother would send him to London on the train, and then he would get picked up by Gandalf for safety reasons, <laughs> and escorted, <laughs> and escorted to the meeting, and people look at me now and they're like, what? And I'm like, it was 1965, it was fine. <laughs> um, so, sorry. Oh, so he's always been really supportive. He thought this was a great idea, because he gets fandoms. He gets how mm -hmm. powerful they are, and how passionate we get, and things like that. Um, so he's always a willing victim. He's got a better palate than I do. I'm really good instinctually with food, but he's actually really good at telling me why it doesn't taste the way I want it to taste. He can find out the missing ingredient or whatever. Um, and then for the cookbook, I actually had 12 testers. So I put out a call on my blog, and I got a thousand responses wow. to test, which was really nice. So if any of you were one of them, thank you very much. I did read them all. I promised I would read every one. Um, and it took a long time for me to get through them, but I picked 12, and they were sort of the inner cooks, expert cooks, a, a good wide range. Um, and they gave me some feedback on recipes that didn't work for them or things like that. But other than that, the only other time anybody really tests for me is if I have a dinner party or something like that. And I usually feed them all out on their food, and they have no idea. <laughs> so, uh, you can actually do it without anyone knowing. <laughs> I saw that you redid your kitchen and you did the video of the oysters and everything and I was just wondering how your kitchen has helped with with all the new gadgets and everything. Gadgets and that's a good yeah. question. That's a good question because when we moved into that house, um, the fridge, it's like it didn't work after two days and then the stove quit about a week later. So most of Outlander Kitchen in the blog in the early years I did in a, on a $350 Kenmore oven that I bought um, because that's all the money we had at the time. I now have a $5,000 oven. Um, the difference is astounding. <laughs> <laughs> that's good though. Wouldn't you have just been crushed if it was like, oh, this is like just the same as Well, I can, tell you, I can tell you we plugged it, we plugged it in. My new $5,000, we plugged it in. It had all these gadgets on it. I looked down and it's got E3. And I'm like, oh my god, what is E3? And I look it up and it's a fatal error. Yeah. yeah. And I live on a small island. It's not an easy thing to return. So we uh, had a drink. <laughs> and then went downstairs and flipped the switch and flipped the breaker back on and it was fine. Yeah. Um, I like a small kitchen. Like, my kitchen still isn't very big. You've seen it, right? It's, it's, it's about this. It's even narrower than this. Um, so I don't think you need a lot of gadgets to cook. In the beginning of the book where I have, you know, equipment, really what you need is a knife. That's really all you need. And that's a lot of what I started with with Outliner Kitchen. As you get older and kneading becomes harder with purple tunnel and things like that, then you pick up a few more, maybe a, a gadget. processor gadget, maybe a KitchenAid, <laughs> maybe something like that. But you know, Mrs. Bob, Mrs. Fitz, they had unlimited resources not Mrs. Bunn, but Mrs. Fitz did in the castle kitchen. She had kitchen maids everywhere. My kitchen aid is better kept, it's cleaner, uh, and it's easier to boss around. So um, I love my new kitchen, to answer your question, because it was getting pretty grotty back there. But really, I'm, I'm happy in any kitchen as long as there's an oven and a counter that I can stand at. If you think about what these, a lot of these women in Scotland in Crofts were doing, Crofts were teeny tiny houses, no window. The only light that you got was from a peat fire. If you've ever had a peat fire, it glows. It doesn't give off any light, so it would have been almost pitch dark in there. And they sat on low, low stools, like a three-legged stool, a lot like that, with a bowl in their lap and a dirk. So I don't never, ever, ever complain about any modern kitchen anymore. I always think of like stabbing someone and taking them home. <laughs> well, or making that's what I, every time I read an 18th century recipe or earlier, it involves egg whites. Make like I'm always like, oh my god, this is somebody like 
hours with probably like some pieces oh, yeah. of straw, you know, like oh, oh, yeah. whatever, you know, trying to. <laughs> after, you after, after they had all peaked for six hours right, all exactly. day, and then yeah, a really harsh light. So, yeah. Do we have one more question, and, and then we all need to sign in. Okay. Um, did Diana test any of the food that you made or give feedback on? The only, the only ones that Diana has ever tasted, I um, I met her in Surrey at the Surrey Writers Conference, which is up in BC a <coughs> few years ago, and I took her a batch of Stephen Bonnet's salted chocolate pretzel balls. The byline is Stephen, Bo Stephen Bonnet's salted chocolate pretzel balls. One is never enough. <laughs> 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 Only out of the fans get those. Everybody else is like, what? They're really good though. I want two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I she she has a copy of the book. She keeps telling me she's gonna she's gonna get around to it, but she's just so busy right now that it could be a while. Okay. She's an amazing cook on her own. So she has a number of sort of recipes. She's got a pomegranate tree in her front yard, so she's always coming up with recipes for pomegranates and things like that. She's a good cook. Cool. Did we have one more question? Yeah, sorry, I, more. I was just going to ask the dog question. What kind of dog? Oh, he's a sheep. Sheep. I adopted him from uh, the SPCA about seven years ago, so he's 14 now, but he's Koga. And he's and he's he's in a few outlander kitchen pictures. Actually, he's in the back of the book. He's standing on my back in the back of the book. We're picking nettles there, and uh, he doesn't like nettles. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. Yes, one more. Yeah, yeah, so what's next after, after this one? I've got a couple of ideas. I don't usually talk about my ideas because I find once you've yeah. released them into the world, you lose control of them. The and the power, but I do have. A, I hope I have what I hope is a really good idea that I'm going to start working on in about three or four months. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you all of you for being here at Book Order. I really sincerely appreciate it. Um, Teresa is going to sit right over here. Okay, everyone. Sign signing out. <laughs>